Hello there, my fellow space gladiators, and welcome back to some Battletech lore. Today, as sort of a standalone video, even though it comes after my series on Rel Tours I did recently, I wanted to tell the history of one of the most famous worlds in Battletech. Famous or infamous, depending on who you're asking. And this world is none other than Solaris 7, the place most known for its gladiator-esque battle mech entertainment. This video is gonna be like I said about its history though, not the matches themselves. As a long time ago I did make another video on Solaris 7, and you can find it in this same playlist. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Solaris 7, or the Game World, is known across the galaxy for its mech fighting. Gamblers place ridiculous amounts of money on long shot bets, and fortunes are won and lost on a daily basis. Solaris City in particular has six major arenas and many mech warrior stables. Every year there was a grand tournament, which concluded with the naming of the year champion. The game world has long since been a choice location to hire mercenaries to. However, unlike Galatea or Outreach, many of the people available for hire on Solaris 7 are individual warriors and not mercenary commands. The quality of those available for hire is usually good, as the skills required to succeed in the arenas are usually high. Unfortunately, the employers have to realize that, sometimes, they might also be getting a prima donna instead of a down and dirty warrior. At the end of the day, this means that Solaris mech warriors possess greater independence and are, unfortunately, more likely to breach a contract than their brothers of greater experience. Solaris 7 was always a highly industrialized world, and as such, was a natural choice for battle mech factories and testing areas. In the good old days of the Star League, competing battle mech manufacturers began to let their new models fight each other in front of highly placed Star League representatives to encourage the purchase of their mechs. The very first fight, supposedly, took place between a Phoenix Hawk and a Sentinel, all the way back in 2695. It wasn't long until these events were broadcasted on the planet and bets were placed on the outcomes of the fighting. Mercenaries would use Solaris as a training ground as well. The popularity of the fighting grew steadily, and by the time of the Amaris coup, Solaris was already famous for its dueling, some of them shown across the entire inner sphere. Initially a planet that belonged to the Free Worlds League, the world suffered quite a lot in the early throes of the Succession Wars. At the beginning of the fighting, Solaris turned to the Lyrans during the First Succession War. However, a Marek fleet in retaliation bombed the planet with nuclear weapons. In 2820, the FWLS Despiser, an Essex-class warship serving the Free Worlds League, supported a raid by elements of the Red Eagles and Clinton's Cutthroats mercenaries against Solaris 7. After the attackers on the ground had finally been driven off, the Despiser conducted an orbital artillery bombardment on the planet with tactical nuclear weapons narrowly missing the northern fringes of Solaris City proper, but causing considerable damage to the suburbs and industrial centers, and of course, killing a lot of people. Funnily enough, even two centuries later, by 3055, locals are still commemorating the 2nd of April 2823, as a day when the Despiser was lost in a misjump. The deals on Solaris only suffered in the beginning because of the lack of mech warriors due to the war. Until 2800, the world had recovered from the stagnation again, mainly because of the huge project to build five battle mech arenas in Solaris City, each of them representing one of the great houses, in which the warriors of the successor states would fight for the honor of their nation. This led to the first real Solaris Championship in 2812, and ever since, the championship was held every year. In the subsequent succession wars, Solaris again suffered devastation, including the near destruction of blue shot weapons in 2998, when the FWL used the 4th Marek Militia to attack the International Zone and then retreat to the Roland Fields. In 3002, the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces easily stopped another Marek offensive. 
Loki would sabotage one of the Merrick dropships, crippling a whole battalion of mechs, while the rest of the defenders easily isolated the rest of the invaders. The only Merrick success in that fight was the destruction of some factories in Solara. In 3020, the 33rd Merrick Militia, augmented by Seguin Strikers mercenary unit, once again attacked the planet. But relentless aerospace fighter attacks and the mounting counterattack by regular Lyrans and Hansen's Rough Riders repulsed them. In October of 3028, the LCAF repositioned several frontline units as the Free Worlds Inc. military launched their Operation Dagger. One such unit was the 32nd Lyran Guards, which were relocated to Zanaya, leaving Solaris guarded by the Ten of Sky Rangers. The LCAF's strategic intent wasn't to prevent a League invasion, but rather to make the invaders pay dearly for any kind of gain, and slow the progress of any breakthrough. In 3043, the Atrian Hussars once again mounted a raid on Solaris, which, once again, ended in disaster for the FWL. You know, after all these failures, you'd think that the FWL would simply leave them be. Following the clan invasion, Kai Allard Liao moved to Solaris 7 and won the mantle of champion from 3055 to 3056. Despite speculation that he would surpass Grey Noton's legendary seven-year reign, Liao instead retired and returned to active duty. It was at the conclusion of the invasion that Solaris became the biggest community for Russell Haig expats. While they never gained their own quarter in Solaris City, many became famous as deadly competitors, fighting for other stables no matter their affiliation. Their matches generated big sums, which were channeled in helping needy Russell Hagians, as well as supporting partisan struggles behind the lines. Just before the beginning of the Felcom Civil War in 3062, Friction between the Davion and the Lyran loyalists heated inside the city, and riots broke out. The garrison of Comstar had been transferred off the planet at command of the LAAF Archon. The Fedsons aligned Solaris citizens and mech warriors formed alliances to fend away the Archon Princess Katrina Steiner Davion's loyal stables. These groups formed after the two factions Quasi-Champion Michael Searcy and Victor Vandergriff fought their championship match in the Steiner Stadium, which would spill over into the streets. The factions made an alliance between stables and cooperatives forming makeshift battalions fighting into the city. LAF peacekeepers, the 32nd Lyran Guards, failed to contain the fighting, with their commanding officer dead, unfortunately, and they had to be consolidated with Steiner loyalists. It wasn't until the champions Cersei and Vandergriff again fought in the darkened ruins of the Steiner Stadium that the initial fighting ended in their mutual annihilation of one another. The word of Blake invaded Solaris suddenly on the 16th of June 3068, with the 25th Division. They took advantage of the chaos caused by the war between the FWL and the Sky and Boland provinces of the Lyrans, as well as the absence of the Com Guards previously assigned to Solaris. The Blakists refer to the invasion, quite cheekily, I might add, as Operation Showtime. And while the word of Blake initially managed to escape being identified, the sheer number of free agents and stables on Solaris quickly led up to the building of an underground resistance movement, which came to be known as the Solaris Home Defense League. During the first days of the invasion in 3068, Yoris University Amalgamated made a significant find buried beneath the dark sands of the Tangerine Desert. A mixed force of the Word of Blake tried to crush the site and destroy all the artifacts, but a small mercenary unit, Ganon's Cannons, was able to stall them for the others to escape. Following the occupation of Solaris, the Solaris Home Defense League engaged in months of low-level resistance. In June 3070, the Resistance used a number of Savior Repair Vehicles as transports to move several platoons of infantry and dispossessed mech warriors into position, and then they launched raids on several Blakist supply caches. Having captured important quantities of ammo, parts, and battle mechs, the Resistance then used the Saviors to move the supplies out of Blakist territory. The level of Resistance activity would change dramatically on the 3rd of May 3071 when the Home Defense League launched a daring attack on Solaris City itself, securing the International Zone. 
It was the first time that the mercenaries, Ganon's cannons, were contracted by some stables to support the SHDL. This was only the beginning of a campaign to recapture the city, and the Home Defense League managed to push the defending Blakis out of Solaris City by June 11th. Also around June, a number of the gladiators dropped out of regular fighting to get back into the arenas. The open class arenas were still closed, but many class 2 and class 3 arenas were opening already, as the city's denizens attempted to get back into the swing of things. Even Eric Gray was offered several championship bouts, but he refused them all because he was fighting against the Blakis still. In August 3071, the Blakis launched a Blitzkrieg-style assault on the International Zone, reclaiming control of the zone by the 17th of the month. It would take until the 15th of October for the Solaris Home Defense League to push the Blakists out of the city again and into the reaches. The Blakists would finally cede control of Solaris and leave the planet on the 11th of December 3071. When the Jihad ended, the problems around Solaris City still increased because of the return of refugees. At the time, the government struck a devil's bargain with the surviving Mafia and the elements of the Triads and the Tongs, and these became the effective overloads of all the refugee camps. In 3079, only one company of Solaris was capable of continuing to design and build anything other than Retrotech mechs. This was the Vining Engineering and Salvage Team. Based out of the city of Zolara on Greyland, Vining were busily recruiting experienced and skilled personnel from other firms as the Jihad drew to a close. Where once Solaris City was split into six districts, each with virtually its own government and police force, the Jihad would change everything. And after that, the entire city was put under the planetary government's sole administration. While the bulk of the Lyran Alliance Sky Province joined the Republic of the Sphere after the signing of the Republic Formation Treaty, the Lyrans insisted on retaining Solaris in the Alliance. Despite the nearly total devastation of their military industrial base, the Lyran government was loath to interfere with the fact that the industry rebuilding on Solaris in the wake of the Jihad focused on supplying the arenas. And the arenas were enough of a financial boon to render them the preeminent Lyran interest even ahead of the military production. By 3145 though, the planet was under the control of the Wolf Empire. Under them, the Solaris Games still continued. A special exhibition match series, the Royal Fantasy Tournament, continued on until at least 3146. The arenas found new use for the clans as well, for in 3146's Great Reaving, the Wolf Empire used the venues for trials. After the Wolf Empire army departed for Terra in 3151, Solaris 7 was one of the most important worlds where unrest against the Wolf Empire grew. In August, unknown raiders in black-painted battle mechs, suspected to be arena fighters, struck the spaceport warehouses bordering Solaris City's international zone, and escaped aboard three dropships before the Wolves could interfere. The dropships had not been spotted entering the system, and they were not tracked leaving orbit indicating that the Wolf Garrison had a potentially well-equipped and well-trained foe nestled on Solaris itself. In January 3152, Clan Seafox began selling Wolf-manufactured items on Solaris 7. The equipment appeared to have been made in Terran factories, which for the Wolf Garrison raised disturbing questions about the military readiness of their supposedly victorious brothers on Terra and the lack of support for the Empire they'd left behind. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you today on the world of Solaris 7. Actually one of my favorite planets in Battletech, all the way from the good old days of MechWarrior 4, Mercenaries. I might not remember that much from that game story, but even today I remember the matches of Solaris, and the awesome commentary of Duncan Fisher. Anyway, I welcome, as always, any of your thoughts on Solaris 7 in the comments below. And if you have any favorite planets of your own, do let me know. I'm not making any promises here, but I would like to make a series on famous Battletech planets at some point in the future too. If you found all this informative or entertaining, do leave a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon for future content. 
Have a healthy and awesome day, and thanks a lot for watching.